We thank you for that name, Jesus, your son, that left heaven one day and came down to earth. That name is personal. It's personal to each of us that knows Jesus Christ, each of us that have invited him into our lives. It's personal to those that we're meeting today in the passage, Cornelius, uh, certainly, uh, and to Peter and Father, that name has been special down through the years. It continues to be special today, and it will be special when earth and heaven both has passed away, and a new heaven and a new earth is set up for all believers. In Christ's name I pray, amen. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, today uh, to the book of Acts. Acts is simply the Acts of the Apostles. After that Christ had ascended back into heaven, he left them a mission to carry out, and that was not only to teach and preach to the whole world, but to teach you and I to teach and to preach to the whole world as well. I've titled my message today, uh, I Love to Tell the Story. There's something about the story of Jesus that uh, I guess because it is so personal. I guess because Jesus one day left heaven to come down to visit me and to visit you. And then he did almost the unbelievable in that time and, and really the unbelievable in the time that we're living. He went to the cross of Calvary to die for the ungodly, to die for you and me. He made a way, he made a way for you and I to approach a holy God. Up until Jesus Christ, up until his coming, up until his death on the cross, up until his resurrection, up until his ascension back into heaven, you and I could not approach a holy God. We find that over and over again in the Old Testament. So that's why I love to tell the story. It is not just about something that happened a long time ago. It is about something that is happening today. And it's about something that's happening in my life, and hopefully in your life as well. We meet a couple of gentlemen today in our passage. One is called Cornelius. And then, of course, Peter uh, is the carrier of the gospel to Cornelius. Now, let me remind you why that is so important to me. And I believe it should be important to you as well. Cornelius was a Gentile. And up until this time, the Gentiles were not considered someone that God loves or someone that God cares about. As a matter of fact, they could not be a part of the Jewish nation unless they became, and the Bible calls them proselytes, unless they accepted Christ, uh, accepted God's way in the Old Testament law, and then was circumcised. And circumcision began to be a mark of a Christian Jew or a Christian non-Jew. And if one did not have that mark, they were not invited or not supposed to be a part of God's family according to the old Jewish law. Now let me remind you of something. What makes that so important to me? I'm a Gentile. You're a Gentile. Unless you're a Jew in the house, and if you are, we welcome you. And it was here that we began to realize that God has no respect of person. When Jesus came, he came to die for every person that ever lived that would accept what he did in his finished work on the cross. That's why I love to tell the story. And today... We're going to be looking at a very simple passage in Acts Gospel, the 10th chapter. And I think the first few verses, we aren't going to cover all of the verses as we go through this passage today, but we're going to pick out the important ones. And we'll just begin with the first verse uh, in chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called Italian Band. Now, Cornelius was a good man. The Bible reminds us of that. But let me remind you folks, good men, good women do not go to heaven unless 
They accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That, my friends, is our ticket into heaven. And nothing else whatsoever, not baptism, not church membership, nothing else is our ticket into heaven other than recognizing the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary some 2,000 plus years ago. And that is our uh, entry into heaven. And even before heaven begins, it is our entry into the very kingdom of an awesome God. I'm glad that Peter received a vision. And in this passage, there are two visions. Cornelius received a vision, whether it was a dream or a vision or what, uh, that doesn't bother me. But he received a dream to send some of his men over to Joppa to visit Peter. Now, that was somewhat hostile territory because that was a Jewish area and, and, and where Cornelius was in, uh, in, uh, in Caesarea was kind of, of a non-Jewish area, although there was some mixed in uh, both places, I'm sure. And then at the same time, God had given... Peter, a vision about what was clean and what was unclean. The Old Testament law, Leviticus, if you want to read it, be a bit confused as you read it probably, talks about all of those laws. Certain animals were edible and certain animals were not. Certain foods were edible and certain foods were not. When God gave his vision to Peter. It was long about mealtime. Peter went up on the roof. The roof, we're told, were mostly flat at that time. And he sat, and he sat up there resting, waiting for someone to call him. Peter, dinner's ready. He had a vision. And you know that, but I'm just going to remind you a little bit of it. The sheet came down from heaven, and all kinds of animals considered by the Old Testament law that were unclean, showed up. And Jesus said, Peter, take and eat. Oh, no, no, no. No, I can't do that. I'm a Baptist. Baptists don't do that. And the voice came down from heaven, nothing that I have made is unclean. Now, we know as we finish the chapter, we know why God was speaking that way and gave Peter that vision because the Jews, again, had all kinds of no-nos in their religion. Kind of like some of us do today. And when someone violates that no-no, we kind of become quick judges that they don't belong. Well, the vision that God was giving to Peter is meant for you and I today to let us know that nothing that God has created is unclean, nothing is unfit for the kingdom of God, and nothing is out of the realms of why Jesus came and died on the cross. And that was uh, identified in a different scripture that we might seek and save, that he might seek and save that which is lost. Let me read a couple more verses uh, in the first part of that, and then we'll, then we'll move on a little further into our outline and into the scripture. Verse 2, he was a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and he prayed to God always. Okay, let's look at the devout man. He was a good man. He was a good man, but he didn't know God. Good people. Good people are in our world today, but without Jesus, without Jesus, they will not enter heaven. Or we will not enter heaven without Jesus in their lives. So this is a record of a good man. 
and one that feared God. You know, you can fear God and still not believe God. This was somewhat of where Cornelius was. He feared God. And then he gave a lot of help. Alms can mean money, it can mean help, it can mean food, it can mean whatever. But he gave a lot to people. He loved people, he cared for people, and those that were hurting, he tried to help them. May have even been in the synagogues at some point. I don't, I don't think the scripture certainly doesn't tell us that here, but it doesn't tell us that it had not, and he may have given to the ministry. I, I, I don't know, but, but he was a man that really cared and that he really gave and prayed to God always. Now, this kind of got me just a little bit, that passage. Not that I don't believe it, I do. But I think I've been telling people that the only prayer that God hears from a lost person is when they want to accept his son, Jesus Christ. According to this, according to this, Cornelius prayed to God, had a regular prayer life. But the fact was, he didn't know God. And that, my friends, is a big difference. But God heard his prayers. How do I know that? Let me just remind you how I know that. Verse 4. And when he looked on him, an, an angel appeared to him, and that was quite often in the New Testament, and, and sometimes it, it could have even been Jesus Christ himself. Uh, that's not where we're going today uh, with this thought. But God heard Cornelius' prayer, and he sent an angel to minister to Cornelius. Pick up at verse 4. And when Cornelius looked on him, he was afraid. That's nothing new any of us would have been. And he said, what is it, Lord? Now here we find his prayer life is coming a little clearer to me in the fact that God apparently had heard his prayers. He looked on him and he was afraid. What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy giving and caring to others are come up for a memorial before the Lord. So now I've got to change my thinking a little bit. God does, or God did, hear an unbeliever's prayer. And he answered his prayer in an unbelievable way. You know, when, when something appears to us, and we see it, we know it, and here we find God sent an angel down to meet with Cornelius, and to talk with Cornelius, and to give Cornelius Assurance that God heard his prayers, and then he gave him, uh, gave him directions of what now God wanted him to do. Verse 5. Now, the, the, the angel is still speaking. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. I don't know if, I, I, I kind of don't believe that Cornelius and Peter had ever met because one was a Jew and one was a Gentile. Scripture don't tell me that they had or that they had not. But here we find God working in one person and then working in another person to bring them together for a cause. That's why I often say from the pulpit, we're not here today because we chose to come. We're here because God chose for us to be here. And no matter what happens in this sermon as it continues, good singing has already been, giving of your tithes and offerings has already been. But God has a special blessing for every person that is sitting in the house today. Had Cornelius not obeyed God, he would have never met Peter. Maybe would have never been saved. I don't know. But God had two men bringing them together and working together. 
and he already had the time of the service set up. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome that God is, is involved in, in that kind of planning? That he even had the time of the meeting set up. And then verse 6. One lodge is there, or one is there, in Simon a tanner's home, and that's where you need to go. And when the angel had spoken unto Cornelius and was departed, he called two of his household servants. Cornelius didn't wait. He didn't say, now let me think about this thing. Let me go talk to my friend. He knows more about Jewish people than I do. Let me just go talk with. No! God had sent a messenger. And let me tell you something, folks. That messenger doesn't always have to be an angel. Sometimes that messenger is you and me. Sometimes when we make a visit, we think that we're going. But here we have record that God sets things up that are godly. So don't wait for angel to come and stare you in the face. If it does, great praise the Lord. Don't wait for that. Whoever stares you in the eye and talks to you about Jesus, whether it's through music, whether it's preaching, whether it's teaching Sunday school, or whatever. God has set that meeting up. How do you know that, Pastor? The Bible tells me so. And when the Bible tells me something, folks, let me remind you, I believe it. I believe it. So we're finding a Gentile and a Jew meeting with God being the instructor of the meeting place, the meeting time, and the meeting message. And you know what? We serve the same God today in the 21st century as Peter served in the first century. Talking about the same Jesus that Cornelius accepted in the first century. So folks, don't ever forget that you might be that angel that appears to somebody on God's timing and by God's timing. You may not receive a vision here, but this vision is reminding us of how God works not only in Peter's life, not only in Cornelius' life, but in the life of Healthford Baptist Church. God has not changed. God has not changed. What He has done in the past, He continues to do in the present. A couple of verses and then we'll get to our outline. And then verse 9. On the morrow as they went on their journey, the men going to find Peter, they drew nigh unto Peter, who had gone up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. He became very hungry, and that's when God began to prepare Peter for meeting Cornelius. When he brought the sheet down, and the sheet was full of unclean animals, and God said, take and eat. Let me just remind you what that means to me a little bit. It's not the animal thing, it's the people thing. No one. No one. Is beyond the love of God. No one is beyond the forgiveness of God. 
And it is your duty and my duty to make sure that the people know that. That the people know that. Now, we, we're not going over Peter's vision at all, but I do want to hop down and pick up at the 23rd verse. Peter visits Cornelius. Then called he them in. Peter had gotten there. They knocked on the door, I'm sure, or whatever they, ever how they exchanged greetings at that time. And Cornelius invited Peter in. Uh-oh. Something's wrong here. You was not allowed to go into a Gentile's home. It was an Old Testament law. And Cornelius, I'm sure, knew about that. I, I say I'm sure, I'm not sure, but he probably did. But certainly Peter knew that he wasn't supposed to go in. And you know what Peter did? He cursed friends with him. Some Jewish friends. And you know what happened when, when Cornelius opened the door and invited him in? Let's read just a couple of verses. Then called he them in and lodged with them. So Peter came in and, and they kind of talked together. No, this was, this was the folks that were, were coming uh, to talk to Peter about going. And on the, on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren with him. And on the morrow... After they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and he called them together, his kinsmen and his near friends. And as Peter was coming, Cornelius said unto him, saw him, and he fell down at his feet to worship him. Of course, we know the story. Peter said, no, don't do that. Matter of fact, that happened with John over in the, uh, on the Isle of Patmos when uh, when he fell down at an angel's feet. And he said, no, no, don't do that. Peter was saying, we're, we're, we're individuals. We're, we're the same. We're, we're human beings. We may just be different nationalities. You may be a Gentile. I may be a Jew. But Peter said, you don't worship me. My friends, any time that we worship anything apart from God, whether it's our hobbies, whether it's our car, whether it's our home, whether it's whatever it might be, any time we be put something above God, that becomes a sin. It becomes wrong to do that. So Peter immediately let Cornelius know that he wasn't any different than he was. Peter also knew that it was wrong for him to enter into the house of God. And had it, here's the importance of the vision that Peter received of all of those uh, animals coming down. He received a vision that said nothing is unclean. Not just unclean animals, nothing is unclean. And Peter had understood that. I'm sure Peter prayed about that. Because I got a, we pray about a lot of things. I got a feeling everybody here prayed about coming to church this morning. I don't know, you're not wrong if you didn't, but we do that. And I'm sure Peter prayed about it and, and God spoke to him and, and God, through the vision and then through his mind thinking, had him ready to meet Cornelius. Picking up in verse 20. Picking up at verse 27. No, I'm, I'm in chapter, I got chapter 12 over here and 13 and 11. So let me back over to chapter 10. Picking up at verse 44. So Peter went in the house. They did their formal greetings. I'm sure they had a little gentle chit-chat. And Peter got on to business. While Peter yet spoke the words of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, fell on them which had heard the word. This was Cornelius and his family and other guests that he might have had there. The Holy Spirit, up to this point, was only for the Jews. And now, <coughs> excuse me, 
the Jews that Paul had taken with him, I'm sure they probably scratched their head a little bit when Paul went in the house. And now they're hearing these people speak under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And then, verse 47 and 48, Paul said in verse 47, and he was talking to those six that he brought, I'm sure. Can anyone forbid water to these that, should, that they should not be baptized? Who have received the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, as we all have. Evidence of God's hand being upon Cornelius and his family was that the Holy Spirit of God entered them as they accepted Peter's message and Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. They accepted that. So then Peter asked the question, and, and like I say, I'm sure he was pointing to his, his folks. He asked the question, can any forbid these to be baptized? And certainly nobody spoke up. In verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Don't know how long Peter might have tarried or not, but in a way, Gentiles. And this is a record of the first Gentiles, of the first you and I's. Not a good English sentence, but I want you to hear that. The first you and I's that ever had the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. Had we been living in the first century, we was outcast. But this laid the work that Paul, see, Paul was called to preach to the Gentiles, and he later preached, but Peter kind of laid the groundwork. Just in case you want to fill in your blanks, let's do that real quickly. Uh, Cornelius the Gentile and verses 10 through uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. And then uh, Peter the Jew, uh, verses 9 through 22. And then Peter visits Cornelius, uh, 23 through 33. And then Cornelius, uh, the Gentiles are baptized, uh, 23 through 33. So uh, if you want an outline, I'll have some out in the bulletin. If you, if you need those, I'll have some. Uh, out in the North X next week, and you can pick them up and make sure you get them. That moving a little fast, I know, for you to, to write them down, but, but in a way, uh, I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story.